الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء رفعها ووضع الميزان ألا تطغوا في الميزان وأقيموا الوزن بالقسط ولا تخسروا الميزان والأرض وضعها للأنام فيها فاكهة والنخل ذات الأكمام والحب ذو العصف والريان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان خلق الإنسان من صلصال كالفخار وخلق الجان من مارج من نار والصلاة والسلام على إشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد عود بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذا حللتم فاسقالوا الحمد لله رسلك برادس فرنس حلس علماء It is a pleasure to be here today to host the Halal Hunters Guide, an initiative of the Jamia Al Ulum Al Islamiyah. In brief, the Jamia is a subsidiary of the Jamia Al Ulama of South Africa, which offers an intensive Islamic course for the development of ulama. I would like to thank all in attendance, those that are present here in the gathering and those listening online. I give you the clear tidings of the virtues mentioned in the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Majtama'akumun fi baytin min buyutillah yatluna kitab Allah wa yatadarasunahu baynahum that none gather in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reciting the Qur'an, learning and teaching one and other from the Qur'an illa nazilat alayhim al-sakina except that tranquility descends upon them. وَغَشْيَتْهُمُ الرَّحْمَةِ And the mercy of Allah envelopes them. وَحَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ And the malaika, the angels surround them. وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them by those that are by him, meaning the gathering of the angels, the gathering much better than ours. May Allah grant us all this version. Now we will begin with the recitation of the Holy Qur'an. And I think it is important to mention that coupled with the reward for reciting the Qur'an, the one listening to the Qur'an will also receive great reward. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُمْ وَأَنْسِكُوا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ And when the Qur'an is recited, then listen attentively to it and keep silent so that you may be shown mercy. In, Ibn Sa'di mentions in his tafsir, that one who holds on to these two aspects, listening attentively and keeping silent while the, while the Quran is being recited, he will attain abundant good, goodness in his life. He will attain insight in deen and his iman will manifest. And as for the one that does not hold on to these two, then he will lose his portion in the mercy of Allah SWT. May Allah grant us the tawfiq practice to, to listen attentively to the Qur'an and take benefit from it. In the portion that will be recited today is from the first few verses of Surah Maidah. In the first verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions uh, the, the halal aspects where um, grazing livestock is halal. And in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the impermissibility of hunting whilst in ihram. Then going in the second ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Once you come out of ihram, then go ahead and hunt, then hunting is permissible. So here we see that whilst in the state of ihram, hunting is impermissible, and whilst out of the state of ihram, hunting is permissible. And in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That aid, support one another in doing good and in the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it is only with the true love of Allah that we attain the fear of Allah. It is only with the true love of Allah that we, are, that we become conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't support one another in sin and hostility. Looking at it in the context of hunting, 
a lot of people become negligent in their salah. So encourage one another to make sure that you perform your salah whilst you are out hunting. Don't listen to the whispers of shaitan telling you that we are busy right now. We don't need, we can delay our salah, we miss our salah, we make qada. No, with help, support one another in doing good. Then in the third in the third ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the aspects which, which are haram. Example, meta, carcass, dam, blood, lahmul khinzir, the meat or the pigs, and a few other aspects which we will not go into right now. And later on in that ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, This is the day that the disbelievers have become despondent that you will give up on your deen. So don't, don't forget about them. Don't worry about them. Don't fear them. And fear Allah. This is the day that I have perfected for you, Adin, and completed my favors, my ni'mah upon you, and I have chosen Islam as your religion. Then in the fourth ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions of our hunting animals and how to go about hunting with hunting animals. So without further ado, I would like to call upon Qari Zawuddin Zabdad, who will render us a beautiful recitation of this portion of the book. Assalamu <laughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا وحلت لكم أنيمة الأنعام إلا ما يتلى عليكم غير محل الصيد وأنتم حرم I'm <laughs> 
Citation and this is the kalam of our Allah. This is my Allah, your Allah. This is the kalam of Allah. It is most beautiful. And we, may Allah give us the tawfiq to take heed and to, to increase our recitation of the Quran and to listen to the recitation of Quran and to benefit from it. Next, I would like to call upon uh, Hafiz Walid Bata from the third year who will be rendering to us a beautiful nasheed. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, start off with some durood sharif. Should we have one good uh, go along with me, inshallah. Bismillah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammadin. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa sallim Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammadin Asubuhu badda min tala'ati Walaylu dajamiu wa furatihi Chere se 
तेरे और शब की रौन के से अल्लाह 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 कंज How wonderful was Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says Uswatun Hasana A perfect example The completeness of deen Manifests itself in the guidance That Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came But in every aspect of life Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed us everything The polytheists, the mushrikeen In a mocking manner Tried to tell Salman radiallahu an لَقَدْ عَلَّمَكُمْ نَبِيُّكُمْ كُلُّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى الْخِرَاءِ That your Nabi taught you everything, even how to wash in the toilet. With happiness, with happiness, uh, Salman radiallahu replied, Ajal, yes, even that. That was Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I have blessed you upon a clear path. Everything clear. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed us everything in every portion of our life, how to go about doing it. So it's the hunting season. People are desirous to know which manner to go about doing this. Which, how did Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advise us to go about doing it? Some people do it for enjoyment. 
And once it's done in the manner shown to us by Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it becomes ta'a. And that obedience, and obedience becomes ibadah. So we will benefit from it in this world and in the akhirah, inshallah. So now I would like to leave you in the capable hands of Hafiz Muhammad Saad Jada, who will be giving us a presentation on the halal hunters then. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحد الأقدم يساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله يا سيدي فرنز مرادس الله سبحانه وتعالى سيدنا القرآن وما خلقت الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون الله يسكر إيتر من كاي for the sole purpose of worshiping Allah that's the only purpose the only objective that humankind has is to make the ibadah of Allah and to recognize Allah so everything else we see around us that Allah has created has been created in the servitude of insan, for the service, for the khidmah of mankind. And Allah has made it possible for us to gain benefit from various different aspects of this creation, whether it be animals, whether it be the sun, the moon, mandals in the earth, plants. All of this Allah has created for the service of insan. To such an extent that if you speak to wildlife specialists and people who are involved with nature, they will tell you that the ecosystem is such, if anything is removed from the ecosystem, there will be an imbalance in the ecosystem around us. So each creation around us contributes to the positive upkeep of the environment, of the ecosystem. But if you remove the man, the, the human race from the ecosystem, this will not set any imbalance. In fact, the ecosystem will flourish because there will be less wastage, less extravagance, less harm being done to the environment. So that just helps us understand that we are not sent to this world to actually benefit this world, but to take benefit from this world. So from amongst the various creations of Allah that we take benefit from is that of animals. Allah has made it permissible for us to take benefit from animals. But in doing so, it's imperative and it's, it's necessary for us to make sure that this is done in accordance to the teaching method, the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So inshallah, in tonight's presentation, we'll be going through a comprehensive guide regarding a person's hunting trap and how this could be within the confines of the deen. So some of the objectives are that of tonight's presentation is that we can equip ourselves with some basic uh, masai, some basic rulings regarding what is permissible, what is impermissible. But ultimately it will not be possible to cover all the masai, all the rulings in one presentation regarding what's permissible, what's impermissible. But it will at least create a desire in our hearts or an understanding in our hearts that uh, when a certain situation presents itself, then perhaps I have to refer to an alim. So maybe we won't get all the masail in tonight's presentation, but when a certain uh, scenario presents itself on a hunting trip, then you realize, you know what, I heard something regarding this, perhaps I should check it with a mufti, or I should check it with an alim. And that brings us to the importance also of keeping a good relationship with our ulama so that we can access them and we have access to them whenever the need arises. So an overview of what we'll be covering tonight, tonight's presentation, We'll be discussing the permissibility of hunting and when a person is warranted to hunt with regards to the laws of Sharia. Ah. Thereafter, what methods can be used for hunting in terms of the Sharia? Ah. And then we'll be going through a step-by-step -step hunt, a step-by-step -step guide with regards to shooting, tracking, finding an animal and the slaughtering of that animal. Then certain masail regarding after the hunt, so with regards to the animal itself, the carcass, the skin, the hide, etc. And we'll be going through some miscellaneous masail, miscellaneous rulings regarding the hunt. If during the presentation anything is unclear or ambiguous or needs clarity, then we'll stop after every few slides for the brothers to ask. But those questions are to be kept regarding uh, what's been discussed. So not uh, uh, secondary masail or secondary questions which were emanate from the slides, but if there's any clarity uh, needed regarding what's on the slides or what we're discussing, uh, then we will we'll, uh, we'll tend to that during the course of the presentation, inshallah. So first of all, Allah SWT says in the Quran, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, that Allah has made permissible for us the pure things, things which are pure in nature. وَمَا عَلَّمْتُمْ مِنَ الْجَوَارِحِ مُكَلِّبِينَ تُعَلِّمُونَهُنَّ مِمَّا عَلَّمَكُمُ اللَّهِ and with regards to those animals 
which have uh, which are predatory in nature, if they are taught how to hunt, then Allah has made what they capture for you permissible as well. Allah says that you may eat from the prey which your hunt animals capture for you, and you should recite the name of Allah upon this. Meaning, when you're leading or when you're sending your hunt animal out, then take the name of Allah. Allah says that you should have taqwa and uh, Allah SWT is soft in hisab in a cup. In the next ayah, we see Allah says, That when you leave the state of ihram, then you may hunt. So this indicates the fact that hunting is permissible, but Allah has put some bounds in place, some boundaries in place. For example, when a person is in the haram, he cannot hunt. When he's in the haram area, he cannot hunt. But uh, other than that, it's permissible for a person to engage in hunting. This is a hadith which is narrated in Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. It's narrated by a Sahabi by the name of Adi ibn Hatim radiallahu anhu. So Adi ibn Hatim radiallahu anhu was a Sahabi who was known to be a hunter. And many masail that we have today of hunting, uh, are due to the questions which Ali ibn Hatim radiallahu anhu had uh, put forward to Rasulullah sallallahu So in the various books of our hadith, there are chapters dedicated to hunting. So there are, there are numerous amount of our hadith regarding the topic of hunting. But uh, for the sake of brevity, we will just suffice with one hadith which is actually very comprehensive in nature, uh, as you would see. So Rasulullah sallallahu says to Ali ibn Hatim radiallahu anhu, that إِذَا أَرْسَلْتَ كَلْبَكَ فَتْقُلِ اسْمَ اللَّهُ That if when you send out your animal to hunt, uh, when you send out your dog, but not, not constrained to a dog, it can be any other predatory animal which is trained. So it could be a lion, it could be, if it can be trained, it can be a cheetah, a leopard, as we see in some Arab countries. So one should take the name of Allah. Rasulullah says, when you reach the prey that your hunting animal has captured and you find that prey to be alive, then slaughter it. However, if you reach the prey which your hunting animal captured, but that prey is dead, but your hunting animal didn't eat from it, then you may eat from it, it's permissible for you. However, if your hunting animal had started to eat from the prey, then you should not eat from it, it's impermissible for you, because this hunting animal had actually captured it or hunted for itself and not for you. فَإِنْ وَجَدَّ مَعَا كَلْبِكَ كَلْبًا غَيْرَهُ وَقَدْ قَتَلَ فَلَا تَأْكُلْ فَإِنَّكَ لَا تَكْلِ أَيُّ مَا قَتَلَ And if you find, when you reach the prey, that your hunting animal had captured it, but there was another animal involved in that killing, there was another animal involved in that hunt, then you should refrain from eating because now there's a doubt. You're not sure whether your animal had caused the prey to die or the other animal who was not trained, which is, a, which is not, not a trained hunting animal. وَإِذَا رَمَيْتَ بِسَّهْمِكَ فَذْكُرْ إِسْمَ اللَّهِ And Rasulullah says that when you shoot your arrow at a prey, at an, at an animal of prey which you intend to hunt, then take the name of Allah. فَإِنْ غَابَ عَنْكَ يَوْمًا فَلَمْ, فلم تَجِدْ فِيهِ إِلَّا أَثْرَ سَهْمِكَ فَكُلْ إِنْ شِئْتَ And then if you lose track of the animal, it, it, uh, it escapes your sight and then you happen to come upon it. And there is no doubt to the fact that the animal died from your arrow. Meaning there is no doubt that perhaps um, the, the, okay, the rest of the hadith actually explains that. So it also says, وَإِنْ وَجَدْتَهُ غَرِيقًا فِي الْمَاءِ فَلَا تَأْكُلْ Meaning, if you shot the animal, now you track it, you're trying to look for it, but you find it in a dam or in a river. Now there's a doubt. Did the animal die from drowning or did it die on account of your arrow, your shot? So now a person should refrain from eating and should not uh, consume this animal. Similarly, if the animal has fallen down a cliff, now there's a doubt. Did the animal die because of the fall or did the animal die because of your shot? A person should refrain from eating. As we said, this hadith mutafaq alayhi is found in Bukhari and Muslim. So from the, the ayat of Quran and the ahadith, the ulama have extracted the rulings regarding hunting and we see that hunting is permissible in Islam. So hunting is permissible in Islam, but there are conditions which have to be met for it to be permissible. So the first is one should be reaping benefit from the animal which is being hunted or one should be repelling harm. So in terms of reaping benefit, a person could be taking benefit not only from the meat, but the skin as well, various organs, the various body parts of the animal. This would be permissible, and this would be a valid reason for a person to hunt an animal. Whether he is taking the benefit personally, or somebody else could be taking the benefit as well. This would be permissible to hunt. To repel harm, so for example, you have a farmer who has a flock of sheep, or has some other kind of animals on his farm, and there are predatory animals on that farm, 
which are affecting or uh, harming his cattle, his uh, flock of sheep, his livestock, then it will be permissible for him to eliminate those predatory animals by means of hunting. So it's not that it's permissible to hunt any harmful animal. So you're going to go to a, a farm where there is a harmful animal like a lion or leopard, but that lion or leopard is not harming you or harming anybody else. It will not be permissible to hunt in general. It's in a specific situation where harm is reaching you due to a certain animal, then it will be permissible for you to uh, hunt the animal to eliminate the animal, the animal and to save yourself from that harm. The second condition is that the animal cannot be slaughtered due to it being wild. So Allah has made it permissible for us to gain benefit from animals. However, the correct method in principle for us to gain benefit from an animal, meaning to use its skin or to consume its meat, is to slaughter it. If slaughtering is not possible, now hunting methods become permissible in order to facilitate slaughter. So the golden rule to keep in mind, and we'll be making a lot of reference to this uh, principle ruling, you could say, later on during the slides as well, during the presentation, is that when slaughtering is possible, hunting methods are not permissible. So hunting methods are permissible because an animal cannot be slaughtered. If slaughtering does become possible, then we'll say it is not permissible to resort to hunting methods. So, for example, why would an animal not be, why would it not be possible to slaughter an animal? So we have an animal being wild. Generally, if you have a buck in the wild, it's not possible for you to subdue that animal and slaughter it. So hence, you can use uh, hunting methods to, uh, uh, to, 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 to slaughter it. And if you have a domestic animal, which becomes wild, so in the case of a camel, in the case of a cow, a bull, generally those animals are domesticated. But if the situation arises that they become wild, to the extent it's not possible for you to subdue it and facilitate a normal slaughter, then it will be permissible for you to use hunting methods. <laughs> like that, if you have an animal which is generally wild, but now the, en the animal has been subdued or domesticated, and this is quite common if you go to certain farms, a person might have reared a kudu or an impala from birth and bottle fed it at a very young age. So that animal becomes as domesticated as a sheep or a goat. In fact, sometimes they're more domesticated because they don't, they uh, allow you to approach them, to touch them, to pet them, and they do not flee. So in that case, if a person wants to benefit from the meat or from the skin of an animal, although generally it's a wild animal, in this situation, it will not be permissible for you to use hunting methods to, to, uh, to kill that animal, but rather you have to resort to slaughter. So it's important to keep in mind when slaughtering is possible, then hunting methods are not permissible. And we're going to be making a lot of reference to this, inshallah, during the course of this presentation. So now coming to what a hunter may use in order to hunt. As we saw in the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu a person may use, a hunter may use a bow and an arrow. In the modern context, a person may use a firearm. And as well as we saw in the hadith, a person may use a hunting animal. So when we say hunting animal, a trained predatory animal, like a dog, or a similar kind of um, uh, animal, or a person may use a bird, a predatory bird, uh, a hawk, an eagle, whatever could be trained. So what do we mean by being trained? In terms of the predatory animal, so a dog, a leopard, a cheetah, um, anything else which generally people use to hunt, it would be considered to be trained in terms of sharia, if the dog refrains from eating the prey three times. So you send it out to hunt, it hunts for you. If it eats the meat, you will say it's an untrained dog. If it refrains from eating the first time, now it's in the process of becoming trained. If it refrains from eating the meat the second time, meaning it just captures the animal for you, subdues it, and you take control of the animal. And this happens three times. If it refrains from eating, now the animal will be considered to be trained in terms of the Sharia requirements. With regards to a bird, if the bird is sent out and the hunter has a way of calling the bird back to it, so the bird returns to the hunter, then this bird will be considered to be trained. So we're not going to delve too much into the Messiah of a hunting animal or hunting with it, with a hunting animal, with a hunting animal, because it's not so prevalent amongst our circles, although you do find it perhaps in other countries uh, it's more common in South Africa, it's less common, especially amongst the, our Muslim community. Not many people hunt with an anti animal, so we're not going to go too much in detail uh, with regard to these Messiah. 
But however, the method of hunting with an hunting animal is it first takes the name of Allah, sends the animal out, and um, it will, uh, whatever this, the, the hunting animal captures for the hunter will be permissible. If the hunter reaches it while the animal is alive, slaughtering has to, has to take place. If the animal is dead, it will be permissible for the hunter to consume it. However, it's important to know to know that these hunting animals have to afflict the prey with some kind of injury. So what we mean by that is, if a hunting dog captures a prey for you, but in the process, it didn't injure it, but rather perhaps it grabbed it by the neck and the animal died due to suffocation, this will not be permissible. It has to inflict some kind of an injury. So generally, a wound would be, so it either bites at it or uh, uh, scratches it and captures it in that way. And then if the animal passes away due to the wound, it will be permissible. So for the regards to birds, for example, you know, certain predatory birds, the habit of the bird is to capture the prey, take it to a, uh, you know, a great height and then drop the prey and kill it in that way. So that will not be suitable uh, with regards to halal hunting. <clears throat> so now we, we, we familiarize ourselves with the theoretical rulings regarding hunting. We're going to go through slide by slide a practical hunt, each step of a hunt, uh, what are the various rulings which apply to it. So before the hunt starts, we know that when you're on a hunting trip, when you're around firearms, the first thing which is reiterated is the importance of gun safety. So gun safety is actually from the Sunnah of Rasulullah And if or we do practice gun safety, the person handling a firearm in a range in a, on a hunting farm, generally firearm safety is maintained. But if we do this with the intention of keeping to the Sunnah of Rasulullah this will become a means of ajar, it will become a means of reward for us as well. So the hadith of Rasulullah Rasulullah says that if a person is walking through our masajid or is walking in uh, the, the marketplace, meaning in a public space, and he has with him an arrow, then then he should hold or cover the tip of the arrow. Lest he should harm another Muslim by means of this arrow. So when we're working with firearms, what's, what's the general uh, gun safety rule we should follow? Is it treat every firearm like a loaded firearm? Even if there's, it's not one up, there isn't a magazine in it, we treat the firearm like it's uh, a loaded firearm. So keep the firearm point, pointing downwards, uh, do not point it towards any other person, keep the barrel clear, etc. So here Rasulullah is understanding as to keep the tip of your arrow covered. Right? This is a means of gun safety. The next hadith Rasulullah says, that whoever points a sharp object, like a weapon, at his brother, then that the malaika curse such a person until he, he uh, leaves this, this action of pointing a sharp object at his Muslim brother. So Rasulullah is saying that even though it may be your bio, biological brother, meaning if a person is pointing a weapon at his biological brother, perhaps it's out of jest, it's, it, it's, a, it's a joke. But even in such a situation, a person should not point a weapon at anybody else. So here Rasulullah is giving us practical advice, which people promote today, but not in the name of Sunnah. But even in a joking way, you cannot point a weapon at somebody else. Rasulullah is educating us regarding this, and this is from the Sunnah of Nabi Muhammad So now going through the practical hunt. Your hunter will take the name of Allah and he'll fire his shot at the prey, at the impala or the kudu, whatever animal he's trying to hunt. So this could be by means of a bow and arrow or by means of a gun. So a person takes the name of Allah when a person is shooting the animal. Right? That's, the name, that's the time that the name of Allah should take place. Uh, every other person takes the name of Allah and then there's a slight delay. In a slight delay, uh, perhaps you're looking through the scope you change your mind on which animal you're shooting or you just wait for the opportune moment for the animal to stop or to give you a good view where you can perhaps shoot the right organ or the heart, lung or the head. So if there's a slight delay in it, there isn't any issue with regards to the, the, the taking of the name of Allah, the reciting of this miyah. It doesn't have to be exactly at the time of pulling the trigger, but it should be at the time of shooting. However, if there's a slight uh, delay between the two periods, then that will be fine. If a person forgets to take the name of Allah when shooting, if it's done forgetfully, and a person is excused from, from, uh, from this, similar to when a person is slaughtering, if a person forgets to take the name of Allah, 
then one will be excused from this as well. Sometimes one shot is not sufficient to bring the animal down. So a person fires multiple times, perhaps he's missing or he's not getting a good shot. Then a person should repeat the name of Allah for each shot a person takes. But like we said, if it's left out forgetfully, uh, this, this will be excused. After shooting the animal, it is necessary for the hunter to pursue the prey, to track the prey. So when the prey is wounded, the hunter pursues the prey. When you pursue the prey, there's one of three situations you could find yourself in. The first one is you pursue the prey and you find the prey alive. The second is you could find the prey, but the prey is dead. The prey had died already before you reached it. And the third would be is that you injured the animal, but now it fled and uh, you need to track it, you need to go after it. So we'll be going through each scenario and we look at the ruling which, which applies to each scenario. So the first scenario, you reach the animal, the animal is found dead. After shooting it, you find the animal dead. If you shot with a bow and arrow, then the hunt is complete, the meat is halal, right? If you shot with a rifle, then there are two contemporary views amongst our ulama, and there are senior ulama who have done extensive research <coughs> in terms of uh, shooting with a rifle, and you would find that ulama would say that either the bullet takes the same ruling as that of the arrow, and is halal, you know, the, the point of the, the bullet, uh, it's sharp enough, and it uh, causes the same kind of effect which an arrow causes, hence it will be halal. And there are those who say the bullet is now not sharp enough, and uh, the the, the bullet does not resemble, um, or the, the effect of the bullet is not equal to that of an arrow, then it will not be permissible for you to consume that meat uh, if you found the animal dead, and hence the meat will be haram. So preferably, it would be preferable for you to connect to an alim whom uh, you have faith in, or you generally uh, get your masai from, and ask them uh, regarding this ruling. And it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be suitable for us to discuss now whether the bullet does take the effect of an arrow or not, because First of all, none of us are qualified, and those muftis have really went into extensive amount of research and uh, studies to, to identify what is the effect of a bullet as compared to that of an arrow. So we'll give the Messiah and the rulings of both scenarios. Um, if you are taking the view that the bullet is having an equal effect to that of an arrow, and we'll discuss the Messiah regarding um, if you are taking the fatwa that the bullet does not have the exact effect. Uh, of an arrow. So if the animal is found dead, you shot with a bow and arrow, and it's complete. If you shot with a rifle, there's two opinions. One is the animal is halal, and the other opinion is the animal is not halal. The, animal is, the meat is haram. If you found the prey alive, so you track the animal, and now you find the animal alive. Whether you shot with a bow and arrow, whether you shot with a rifle, the ruling in this scenario is the same, it's equal. You have to slaughter the animal, otherwise the meat will become haram. You find the animal alive after shooting it, perhaps once or multiple times, but when you reach it, the animal still has life in it. Now it's necessary for you to slaughter the animal. So going back to the principle we discussed at the beginning, that hunting methods are permissible when slaughtering is not possible. But should the opportunity of slaughtering present itself, now you cannot rely on hunting methods. So in this scenario, you reach the prey while it's alive. There was an opportunity to slaughter it, but you did not slaughter it. An animal died in that way. It could not be permissible for you to consume the animal, irrespective of whether a bow and arrow was being used or a rifle was being used. In the third scenario, perhaps which most hunters face, that you shoot the animal and now the animal flees. It flees and the animal is injured. So it's necessary for the hunter to track the animal. When tracking the animal, you find that the animal is alive. You reach the animal after some time, the animal is found alive. Again, it's necessary for you to slaughter the animal. If you find the animal dead, but your search for the animal was continuous, it was not broken in between, then we would say the animal is halal for you to consume. So when we say a continuous search, you shot the animal, you notice it's injured, you started to track it, Irrespective of the time it took, perhaps you track the animal for an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, half the day. As long as that, that search was continuous, we didn't go back to camp 
or say, you know, let's go back, we'll have lunch, we'll come back and search later on during the day when it's cooler, or we'll carry on hunting on the other side of the farm, and we'll come back here tonight or this evening to, to see if the animal uh, has fallen. That will be considered a break in the search. If you broke the search and now you find animal dead, it will not be permissible uh, to consume that animal. But if your search was continuous, perhaps yes, on the way you took a short break, meaning while you were searching to take a sip of water or to uh, perhaps read your salah, whatever the case may be, but you were still in the action of searching for that animal, you didn't break the search. And now you find the animal dead, it will be permissible for you to consume that meat and that meat will be halal. Obviously, keeping in mind what we discussed previously, if you shot with a bow and arrow, you shot with a rifle, and the two opinions regarding the rifle. What's important to remember is that in any situation, no matter what situation it is, you shot the prey, you found it alive, it's fled, whether you shot with the bow and arrow, you shot with the rifle, in any situation, if the animal was subdued after shooting and slaughtering was possible, but the hunter fires another shot, killing the prey, or the hunter leaves the animal to die, then that animal will be haram. So if the opportunity to store, or the opportunity to slaughter the animal presented itself and the hunter did not slaughter it. So this happens sometimes the person becomes trigger happy. He's in the bush, the animal is on the floor, it has life in it, but he decides, you know what, I'm going to shoot, shoot it with my handgun, or put a few more bullets in it. If slaughtering was possible, but he chose to just shoot it to death, then that need will not be permissible. Yes, if he reached the animal, the animal was down, but there was reasonable grounds to believe that although the animal is down, I still cannot slaughter it safely because of the nature of this animal. So this happens if a person is hunting buffalo or you're hunting uh, vildebeers or kudu. It's a huge animal, even though the animal is down, it was shot in the leg or shot in the heart, lung, whatever the case may be. But if you approach it and try to slaughter it, there is a risk that it's going to harm you, or you're not going to be able to facilitate a good slaughter, meaning by holding the head and slaughtering the required vessels. So in that case, if there's a need to fire another shot, it will be permissible. And if the animal dies because of the shot, it will still be permissible. But if slaughtering was possible, and this, you can say, happens a lot with smaller game, like an impala or a springbuck. After one or two shots, the animal is weakened, the animal is subdued, uh, this very, this very rare. It's very rare to say that slaughtering will not be possible, and you need to fire more shots. So, in that situation where you could have slaughtered the animal, but you chose to fire more shots or to leave the animal to die, then it will not be permissible for you to consume that meat. But obviously, here your discretion is of utmost importance. Whether you think uh, another shot was needed or not. So now, some messiahs regarding slaughtering. Right? So the Sharia requirements of slaughter is to take the name of Allah, to cause blood to flow uh, at the place of slaughter using a sharp object. So using blood to flow as well, if you are hunting birds, you would find that some birds, after you slaughter them, like tarantals and guinea fowls, you might slaughter them and no blood flows. Sometimes this happens with certain smaller buck, especially the animal was in a state of shock and the blood starts to clot. So as long as you're slaughtering in the place of slaughter, which blood will generally flow from, uh, that, that's the requirement. Even though sometimes, like I said, you're slaughtering a bird and you don't see blood flowing profusely, that will be fine. Anything sharp can be used to slaughter the animal, including wood or stone. And this, is, uh, come, this, this comes from the hadith of Rasulullah, with Sahaba, and quiet from the Bishra, that sometimes we find ourselves with, with a prey, but we do not have a knife on us, can we use something sharp? And Rasulullah had permitted uh, the use of this as well. The vessels to cut, there are four. One is the trachea, the esophagus, two jugular veins, uh, and the carotid arteries. Right? Which, so a person should cut majority of these vessels. So in this diagram, you could see here uh, that uh, you have your esophagus somewhat in the middle. In front of it, you've got your jugular veins. In the back of it, you've got your carotid arteries. And your trachea runs very closely to your esophagus. So it's not necessary to, uh, before we get to that, if you cut one of these vessels, from a practical point of view, most probably you would have cut the others as well. There's a very slim chance that you would have cut some and not the others. So for you to be halal, you should cut majority 
of these uh, these um, arteries and these pipes. It's uh, in, in a game animal it would be very similar to the Qurbani animal. So if you know how to, or if you slaughtered a Qurbani animal, it's a uh, similar kind of a structure in, in terms of the neck. So you would facilitate slaughter in the same way. If the animal is slaughtered from the back of the head and the animal only dies when the required vessels are cut, then it would be halal, though makru. However, if the animal dies before that, it would be haram. So let's assume that a person tries to cut the sort of the animal, but because it's not like how you're cutting on the day of Eid, where you have people to hold the legs and people to hold the body down, and it's uh, you have you can take your time and cut. In the moment while you're trying to slaughter the animal, if you happen to start slaughtering from the back of the head, so normally you slaughter from the front, but now you start slaughtering from the back. And you continue slaughtering till the animal dies. If the animal was alive when you reached your main vessels to be cut, and the animal only died after you severed, after you cut those main um, uh, arteries, then the animal will be permissible to eat. However, if the animal died on account of you cutting from the back and perhaps going through the spinal cord, and by the time you reach the esophagus and the jugular veins, the animal had already died, and it will not be permissible for you to consume this animal. <clears throat> However, if you're in the bush and if it's so difficult to slaughter the animal from the front because the animal is wild and jumping around, then it would be permissible for you to find another shot, to subdue the animal to the extent where you are able to slaughter it in the correct way. Slaughtering inside out to preserve the skin. So this is a slaughtering method which people use in order to pre preserve the skin of the animal, especially when you're shooting a bigger animal or an animal with a more beautiful skin like a zebra or um, perhaps a kudu as well. So you want to preserve the skin. What people generally do is they take a knife, they make a hole or they stab the side of the throat and then they slaughter the animal on the inside. So they try to sever all the required arteries without damaging the outside of the skin. So if a person does this in a way that they're able to ensure the main vessels are cut, that is your trachea, esophagus, the two, two jugular veins, basically whatever's um, inside the neck, everything can be severed and cut. This will be permissible, even though a person did not cut the outside of the skin. So he just made a hole, stab the knife in, and cut whatever was inside, this will be permissible. Some miscellaneous masail, some miscellaneous laws pertaining to the hunt. If more than one animal is killed by the bullet or by your hunting dog, or a different animal is killed other than the one intended by the hunter, this will all be halal. So if you shot, and this happens quite often, you shoot and the bullet exits the first animal and enters a second animal, and both animals are killed with one bullet, then both animals will be considered to be halal. If you were shooting, you were aiming for one animal, but you ended up shooting another animal. This sometimes happens as well. With so many animals together, you aim at one, but you end up killing another animal. We will not say that because you were you had the intention of one, the other is haram. No, those animals are still halal for you. And likewise with your hunting animal. If you sent your hunting animal, your dog after a certain prey, it ended up killing a different prey, that animal will still be halal for you to consume. Shooting animals for target practice is impermissible. And this is from the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Similarly, for a person to use live bait, this is regarding fishing, but generally hunters are fishermen as well. And it's on the same kind of topic of uh, causing unnecessary harm to animals. So using live bait or the practice of catching and releasing will also be impermissible. The hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this regard is that narrated by Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he says that, uh, this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. But Ibn Umar says that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cursed the person who uses a living creature as target practice or for his target practice. Sometimes a person's in the bush and the hunt is a bit dry, a person feels on, let's shoot something else uh, just for the sake of shooting. This is condemned by Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next hadith says, uh, Rasulullah says that Man qatala usfuran fama fawqaha bi ghayri haqqiha sa'alahu allahu an qatli that Rasulullah says a person who kills a sparrow a small sparrow for no good reason 
you know, basically doesn't fulfill the rights of that sparrow. He doesn't eat it or doesn't take benefit from it, but he just kills it. And Allah will ask him, question him regarding the killing of the sparrow on the day of Qiyamah. So this is very common sometimes when the fathers are hunting and smaller children are also involved in the hunting trip. They give an egg and say, you can shoot the birds. So the Bishra in this hadith is condemning the futile killing of even a creature which we would deem to be small and insignificant, like a sparrow, a small bird, like a pigeon, basically. It is impermissible to sell something which is not in your possession or which is uncaptured in the wild. So this is a, a principle in fiqh, that you cannot sell something which you do not have ownership of. Neither can you be sold something which is wild and uh, it's uncaptured in the wild. So how does this relate to hunting? When a person is planning to go on a hunting trip, then sometimes he sells the whole carcass before he even embarks on the hunting trip. So he already sold the meat, he sold the skin as though, as though it's a done deal. But he hasn't even shot the animal as yet. So he secured the sale, but he hasn't secured the animal. This would be incorrect. So it would not be incorrect if he puts the word out there that, you know what, I am going hunting. If I shoot something, would you be interested? So he, he uh, starts connecting with potential customers. He gives people an idea of what he intends to bring back. That wouldn't be an issue. But if it's a done deal, like uh, the sale has been made, a person might be under the impression I already bought the meat and now you return from the hunt trip and you say, you know what, I haven't shot anything. This could cause a dispute. So to sell something in a def definite sale, when you do not have possession of it, will be problematic. Similarly, to sell or buy something which is uncaptured in the wild is also problematic in terms of the Sharia. So a person does not cannot conclude a deal on an animal which you don't have possession of. So we find this happening a lot with regards to your hunting combos. So a hunting combo would say, for example, 10,000 rand, uh, and a person can shoot four animals. You take a discount. You know, you're buying four animals at a discounted price. But now you ask your question, you ask yourself the question, what would happen if all four animals are not shot? What would happen in that case? Some farmers will tell you, you know, no, don't worry, you will shoot all four. But then you ask, but what will, what's, the, what's the recourse if I don't shoot all four? And they don't really give you an answer. They say, no, you will shoot all four. So in such a, 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 a deal, we say there is horror, there is uncertainty, there is contractual uncertainty as to what the end result of that transaction will be. Because you're not sure there's going to charge you the full 10,000 rand. You're not sure they'll give you a discount. He's not sure himself. It's something you'll see uh, at the end of the hunt. So that would be problematic. <laughs> so not to say that it will not be permissible at all to buy these kind of hunting combos, but the way it is structured is of utmost importance. So if there's already an understanding, there's clarity between the farmer and the hunter, they look, this deal is 10,000 rand for four animals. If, if we do not shoot all four, um, I'm still going to charge you the 10,000 rand. And the hunter is happy with this. He understands that the 10,000 rand I'm paying is not only for the animals, perhaps it's for the accommodation as well, entry into the farm, etc., etc. And the hunter is aware of this. Then it will be permissible. Similarly, what some farmers do is they'll tell you, look, the deal is 10,000 rand for these four animals. If you shoot two or three and you don't reach your quota, then you'll be charged according to a different price. So you'll be charged the normal price. That will be permissible because now there's understanding, there's clarity as to what the end result of that transaction will be. But if it's left open-ended and there is no clarity on what the end result of the transaction will be, this will be problematic. Similarly, when a, when a, a farm has a policy of charging for missed shots, that if you shoot at a herd of animals and you miss, then you will be charged either the full price of the animal or half the price. So whether it's a Muslim farmer who's charging this or a Muslim hunter who's paying this, it, uh, the terms of this contract have to be understood prior to the shooting. So if the hunter makes it clear that my policy is you come onto my farm, you're shooting at my flock of animals, I'm going to charge you this price for the shot. And if you hit the animal, then you know you, you, you pay extra and you get the animal. That's understandable. And there wouldn't be any ambiguity in the transaction. But if it's not stated up front that um, if you shoot and you must, you will be charged, etc., then that will be problematic. So perhaps if it's a non-Muslim, you wouldn't really... Uh, you know, you wouldn't take heed to this, but if you're dealing with a Muslim farmer, then we should be aware of this, that the way we structure a deal, the way we structure a transaction 
is of utmost importance regarding the permissibility or impermissibility of that transaction. If a haram animal is slaughtered according to the dictates of Sharia, then the flesh and skin become pure, not for, con for consumption, but for usage. So you have an animal which is generally haram, like uh, a predatory animal like a leopard, a cheetah, a lion. But that animal is slaughtered according to how you would slaughter a halal animal. If by taking the name of Allah, letting blood flow, etc., then that animal becomes pure for you to use it. So you can use the hide of the animal, you can use uh, any other part of the animal which you have usage for, you may use an animal that will be pure. If an animal is not slaughtered according to the halal way, or you find an animal dead, so now the animal is not pure. However, if you tan the skin, the skin becomes pure, and those parts of the that animal which blood does not flow through, like the horns, hooves, and bones, will also be regarded as pure. The last masala regarding miscellaneous laws is that making trophies out of the horns, heads, and bodies of the animals will be permissible as well. If a person wants to make a trophy out of any part of the body of the animal, this will be permissible. Is there anything unclear or ambiguous uh, regarding what we've got, got until right till now? This is a transaction. For instance, you're going on a truck and you're taking orders. You're taking? You're taking an order from a group of friends like Mandya Mansi, Bada, Can you take the, uh, usually you need to wait for the end of the truck. So can you take the cash in trust and say, if I shoot him, I'll pay for the animal and bring it back, and if not, then I'll give you my back. Would that be a, a generous transaction? So um, in, in the, the way you put it forward in that example, if I'm wrong, but if, if your customer is actually, like, like you say, appointing you as his representative, representative, so to say that, you know what, I understand you're going on a hunt, you're taking this money with you, if you shoot the animal, then you, you buy it for me, basically. He has the money for it. And that will be permissible because he's understanding that he's not buying it from you. He's not expecting delivery from you at the moment. But he's appointing you to acquire the animal for him. In that case, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be permissible. So, so as long as there's clarity between you and your friend or the customer at that moment, that you're actually not selling the animal to him at that moment in time, but you, his representative, you're going to the farm, you're taking his money. If the animal, if you manage to acquire the animal, you acquire it for him. And if not, you will return the money back to him. Then that will be fine in that way. As long as it's understanding in both, with both parties, what is the status of the transaction? But sometimes it is uh, the, a buyer. It's not the same. It's not still there. So you can't make this, you can't do the same, conclude the same. So that, 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 that the deal between you and your friend or the customer, this is the customer, he wouldn't, he wouldn't really be a customer with the same one taking place at that point in time. That gives clarity to that. Is there any exception to, to the skin after being dead, who is very keen in terms of music? For example, this skin. After 10, it gets Okay, exactly. After that, sorry, I forgot to mention that actually. So, uh, with regards to a pig, a pig is using Najis Ra'in. So, the, the whole being of a pig is Najis, it's impure. So, that's, that's actually an exception which I forgot to mention. Is that for that? Or... Uh, a pig and a goat is some sort of dog as well. Dog is fine. And a human. Pig and a human. So, a pig. Irrespective of your tanning process, will never become pure because, as we said, the, the being of the thing itself is impure, and a human skin obviously will not be uh, will not be okay for you to use due to the honor given to the human being. This one question: Do you make the uh, shoulder trophy? You're not supposed to have more than this. So, how is it justifiable that you can make a trophy? <laughs> the making of a trophy. The, the, the whole the, the whole no. if, if you keep it in your house, it's, it's like okay. what are we thinking? The whole thing? Okay. 
before the whole thing was before in this in studies if there are many of them now this opinion that it's not permissible because of the border the other argument that the the marginal less problematic of the opinion that it is permissible they say that those objects that were used for idol worship if it resembles idol worship or if it's any of those animals that are used is uh, is things that uh, people nations do worship like the elephant etc <coughs> when it is being permissible means it's something that people do worship then they get permissible to be of it so there is this difference of opinion in this case <coughs> So the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regarding hunting in general, the hadith of the Masakah about the Jaffa, or when it's about Asayda, Ghafala. Rasulullah Sallam says that sometimes a person who pursues hunting, this creates negligence in a person, Ghafala in a person. So how we see this sometimes manifesting itself into this time, the person should be ensure not to miss any Salah. So especially by Asr Salah and the Jumu'ah Salah. Not to say he must only read these Salahs and he can miss the other ones. It's saying that these two salahs generally a person in the bush becomes negligent of. So Asr Salah, you know, Fajr, Alhamdulillah, you're in the camp, so people read Fajr, uh, Bar, we're having lunch at the camp, people read Bar. And sometimes Asr, a person's out on a hunt, and uh, we become negligent with regards to sunset, and we return to the camp after dark, and the Asr Salah um, is must. So special care should be taken that no Salah is must. Um, and if we are out during the day and keep track of time uh, so that the Salah is not missed. So it does a Jumu'ah Salah as well. If, um, you know, recently we've been to a few farms where a person says that you can read Jumu'ah Salah on the farm because many Muslim guests come and they read the Jumu'ah Salah here. Yeah. So it not be correct. You can say the majority of our game farms in South Africa. Um, you could say, we can't give a blanket ruling, but many a times, majority of the times, the game farms do not fulfill the requirements of Jumu'ah Salah. It's out far out of a city. Uh, sometimes it's a private game farm, even public access, etc. So Jumu'ah Salah cannot be performed in majority of these game farms. And uh, for us to take off the extra inconvenience, or not actually an inconvenience, but I mean the extra effort of finding a masjid nearby, perhaps you can drive maximum 20, 30 kilometers, uh, we should try to go that lens. So perhaps we drove two or 300 kilometers to get to the game farm in the first place. To drive an extra 10 to 30 kilometers for one Jumu'ah Salah shouldn't be a very difficult task. However, if a person is Musafir and they do not read the Jumu'ah Salah, uh, or rather, to put it this way, to read your Vahar Salah would be correct, but to make your own Jumu'ah Jama'ah, that would not be correct. So, whereas a person should be going to the Masjid for a Jumu'ah Salah, if a person is Musafir and they read the, the Salah at the farm, it would be correct for them to read Dhar Salah and not Jumu'ah Salah. But as we said, keeping in mind the importance of going to the masjid for Jumu'ah Salah. Blood on the clothes rendered the clothes impure and unsuitable for Salah. So sometimes on a hunt, you're slaughtering, the blood splashes, your clothes um, get soiled with the blood. It's not proper, it's not suitable to perform Salah with those clothes. So keep that in mind. Either you can keep a spare set of clothes or make sure you get back to the camp in time uh, for Salah. And many times, I don't know where these maslas will come, but sometimes the person will say, no, no, just take some water in your hand, sprinkle it over the, the blood, or just take some sand and just throw it over. Or the sun will uh, you know, make it pure. Those are uh, not legitimate ways of cleaning clothes that have been stained with blood. So the blood at the time of slaughter from the animal is regarded to be impure. If it touches your clothes, it will be impure too. It will not be correct to read Salah with those clothes. However, the blood from the animal after slaughter is considered to be pure. So if there's blood um, from the animal after skinning the animal, that blood will not be considered to be as uh, impure as the blood at the time of slaughter. Because slaughtering makes the animal pure for consumption and for usage in the entire animal in itself. Mm -hmm. The certain boots which may meet the, the, the criterion of a hoof of a moza. So preferably if you have a boot which is above the ankle, it's of a thick material, and you could show it to a mufti you know, uh, who will tell you that certain boots you could use as a hoof, you could make masah away, and this will make it easier as well to perform salat, to make wudu 
in the bush. So we can't just give a, a blanket to say all boots because obviously each boot will differ in terms of the brand, the type, etc. But to put it out there, if you consult an alim or a mufti uh, with a boot, perhaps you could use it as a hoof. But to be cognizant of the fact that there should be no impurity on that boot when you are making salah with it. So same rulings as would apply to clothing. There shouldn't be any dung, any blood, any urine on it, etc. So perhaps that's what a boot uh, would look like if you were to make masa or use it as a hoof. To be cognizant of the laws of trade, we discussed the various Messiah regarding the laws of trade, selling something which is not in your possession, uh, having no contractual uncertainty in a deal. Let's be cognizant of that as well when we are out hunting. <coughs> Certain points we could make most of while the person is in the bush. So give the adhan in the bush. Use this opportunity to give the adhan. You know the hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that that if a person is in the wilderness, is in the jungle, is in the wild, فحانت الصلاة Now the time of salah approaches. فلتوضع And now he makes wudu. If he cannot make wudu, there's no water, he makes tayammu. فَإِنَ قَامَ صَلَّ مَعَهُ مُلَكَاهُ And then if he gives iqama and he starts his salah alone, then his two angels join him in salah. وَإِنْ أَذَّنَ وَأَقَامَ صَلَّى خَلْفَهُ مِنْ جُنُودِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يُرَاقْ تَرْفَاهُ And this hadith is found in Muslim Razaq. That if he doesn't find anyone to make jama'at with, and he gives the adhan, and he makes the iqama, and so many creatures, or so many soldiers from the army of Allah, from the unseen army of Allah, join him in salah, that he cannot see the end of the two subs. That so many creatures or so many soldiers in the army of Allah, the unseen army of Allah, join a person in salah. Another hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rasulullah Sallam says, that when you are with your sheep in the desert and you call out the adhan for salah, then raise your voice for no human, jinn, or anything else hears the voice of the Mu'addi as far as his voice reaches, but it will be bear witness for him on the day of Qiyamah. This hadith is found in Sunan Nasa'i. So there are so, there are so many fadilah, there are so many virtues. Uh, relating to a person giving the adhan, giving the qama in the wild, and we should grab this opportunity to grab this ajar as well. Explore your own potential and ponder over the lives of Sahaba. So many times we've been hunting or perhaps fishing, camping, we push ourselves to such limits, we don't realize we had the potential to undergo that difficulty. So a person who fishes will tell you that, you know, when you're out fishing, you forget about buying the meat or eating properly, you suffice on baked beans and uh, bread or crisp in bread. So sometimes these situations we do it with the intention of leisure, but we realize we have the potential to sacrifice so much, to go through so much of difficulty in hardship, but for a pleasurable or a leisure, a leisure trip. So likewise, ponder over the sacrifice Sahaba gave to the deed, and that will allow us to explore our own potential, what we can give uh, in fruitful causes for the upliftment of the deed. Perhaps in the bush would make wudu with a limited amount of water. It will remind us of the sunnah method of making wudu using the mud. Um, you will experience various different aspects of life out of your comfort zone, which will remind us that you know we're doing this as a voluntary act, like I said, for leisure, while Sahaba lived this kind of simple life and uh, they gave so much for the deen of Allah. Another point to make most of or capitalize on, make an intention of sunnah when practicing shooting. So the hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لَيْسَ مِنَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا ثَلَاثٌ تَأْدِيبُ الرَّجْلِ فَرَسَهُ وَمُلَاعَبَتُهُ أَهْلَهُ وَرَمْيُهُ بِقَوْسِهِ وَنَبْلِهِ Sunan Abi Dawood. So Rasulullah says there are three actions or three activities perhaps it looks like it's futile, but actually there's benefit and there's goodness in it. If a person is training his horse, he's riding his horse, and he's in seclusion with his family, and when a person practices shooting his bow and arrow. So in today's time, we'd say that uh, shooting with a, with a gun as well, this would be a means of upskilling a person and becoming proficient in terms of using a weapon. And this would be a means of a person receiving ajar. And the other two hadith, Rasulullah is also giving <coughs> importance uh, to archery. Rasulullah says, you have very strength in archery. Strength is in archery. Strength is in archery. Rasulullah mentioned this three times. <coughs> And Rasulullah says, uh, uh, encourages that one should not neglect practicing his skill in archery. So if we make this niyyah and then carry out this action, uh, this will be a means of us earning reward 
in developing our love and our connection with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So just to summarize what we discussed this evening, on the top left corner, it was from the first circle, we said, when is it permissible for a person to hunt? We said to really benefit or to repel harm. It's permissible to hunt as long as slaughtering is not possible. Right? So to re benefit, repel harm, and slaughtering is not possible. Then one may hunt. How can you hunt? You can use a hunting animal or a weapon. What's the method of doing so? A person takes the name of Allah and shoots a shot. The next is to track the animal. But it's necessary for the hunter to track the animal. If the animal is found dead, we would say the animal is halal, permissible to consume. If the animal is found alive, then the animal must be slaughtered. And the golden rule to keep in mind is that if any time slaughtering is possible, then hunting methods are not permissible. So if slaughtering is possible before the hunt, during the hunt, if any opportunity presents itself to now facilitate a normal slaughter, it will not be permissible for a person to resort to hunting methods. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. So may Allah grant us all the ability to feed, to bring these Messiah alive in our lives, and to bring the Sunnah of Rasulullah alive in all uh, various aspects of our life. This is just a presentation on hunting, but regarding every activity of a Muslim, whether he's in business, even if he's in business, there may so many different kinds of business. There are so many different professions that a person can be in. And regarding every profession, every avenue of business, there is sunnah action. There are sunnah actions which we have to abide by. There are follow actions we have to abide by. So may Allah grant us that bring the knowledge which allows us to gain closeness to Allah and to live our life in every avenue in a way which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah for your time as well. And we ask Allah to make us means of our hidayah and accept us for the hidayah of mankind, inshaAllah. Subhanallah bihamdi, subhanakallah, nashkur ala ilaha, istaghfir kuwa natubu ayah. Thank <laughs> you.